Hello everyone, we are here at MTAC Blackjack and super excited to be joined by guest Kyle McGarley. Kyle, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. How's your MTAC going so far? It's going great. I'm having a blast. I'm getting to do some of the, the bigger, more fun panels that I that other cons, for whatever reason, are just scared to let me come and do. So I'm excited to... We, to we're going to be fearless here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Panels. I'm excited to get to, to, to do some fun stuff here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've we've had discussions from things like um, dog sodomy and <laughs> oh my god, burial burial was was a big theme last night of the man. Uh, okay, um, <laughs> how, how to bury people, dispose of bodies. That was a big thing. All right, all right. So um, I'm so missing yeah. the really good. Panels. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. We are we are just going full in here at Impact. <laughs> So I'll just start off with an easy question. Uh, Kyle, what are some things that you've been working on that you can share with us? Well, I am currently actively still working on the near automata or automata, depending on who you ask, uh, anime uh, with Anaplex and, and Bang Zoom, where they got the whole cast back, which is great. Getting to, to play in that sandbox again. Recently, I, let's see. There was uh, there's a game that came out from Binary Haze Interactive called Redemption Reapers. I was the character Luff, L-U-G-H, and I also got to direct the English voiceover in that game, so that was pretty cool. I got to do a really cool character in the current season of Fallout 76. Uh, his name is Rip Daring, and he is a cryptid hunter. And uh, if you imagine Zap Brannigan as a cryptid hunter... That's Rip Daring, and that was really cool. <laughs> he's sending wave after wave of your own man. <laughs> he's, he's really fun. Really fun character. Right. Uh, I've got a question of, in getting into acting, was there any specific performance or something you saw that was like, that moved you enough to like really get into the industry? Or like, oh, how man. Get into this? Like, you know, voice acting or acting? I, it's, it's so funny that you ask that question, because it's, it's, I feel like that's a question that I need to ask myself every now and then. When I was, when you're a kid, you want to do everything, you know, you want to be an astronaut and a firefighter and a baseball player and, you know, all of the things. And when I was a kid, actor was always on that list. And as the other stuff fell off, actor stayed. I, I cannot remember a time when I didn't want to be an actor. So I really, I, I don't know what it was that like was the impetus for that's what I want to do, but uh there's there have been there have certainly been performances that I've seen that have made me go, ooh, that's really cool, especially when we're talking about voiceover specific because that's the type of acting that i that I ended up uh, finding my my real passion for. Um, I look at uh, one of the earliest ones that I can think of was the audiobook narrator for the Harry Potter series, Jim Dale was so good and that's that's what got me thinking hey maybe i could do audiobooks for a while thankfully i don't do those anymore but i used to and jim dale i definitely credit for that there's a ton of voiceover performers that i can that i can nod to that like rob paulson is fantastic billy west jim cummings maurice lamarche tress mcneil phil lamar there's like all of those those big heavy hitter you know from the cartoon shows when i was a kid those are the, the the people that I'm like, man, I would really love to work with them someday. And I have had the chance to work with Phil Lamar. But uh, yeah, so there's, there's, it's, it's hard to, to pinpoint exactly what it was, but uh, there's a lot. <laughs> What's the biggest challenge for you as an actor? The biggest challenge for me as an actor, man. Oh, this is, uh, this is, this is getting deep. So I think, uh, Part of what makes acting so appealing is that there is this this joy to be found from from performing, from from entertaining other people, uh, and getting to play pretend. And I, when I was you know younger, not even that long ago, like five or or maybe maybe ten years ago, like just breaking into to the type of work that people know me for now, 
every job was new and exciting and everything was like shiny and and I just I I had so much joy going into work on anything and it didn't matter what it was. And as I've gotten older, I've gotten more jaded. <laughs> I've I've everything's gotten more familiar and it's it's not that I don't still love what I do because I definitely do, but I don't feel that same thrill of excitement anymore when I when I walk in like I feel like it's, it's it sounds egotistical to say it, but I feel like I've scaled the mountaintop and there's no new heights to reach. So it doesn't really matter what the job is. Like some are some things feel a little more exciting than others, but it all it all starts to feel very familiar. And I and I I think the biggest challenge that I face now as an actor is is being able to to maintain that sense of joy and excitement and and thrill for for what I'm doing. So just as a follow-up, what keeps you motivated? Because I know voice acting is a very difficult job because, you know, to to use a uh, sports analogy, they say, you know, if you hit the ball three times out of ten in baseball, you're a Hall of Famer. Right, like, yeah. Like the, the, you know, rate of success for voice acting and being... Oh, like, yeah, if you're, booking, if you're booking 10% of your auditions, you're a rock star. Yeah. Like, that's not even possible. Yeah. Uh yeah, I uh I think what keeps me motivated honestly is just the 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 joy of living. Like I I genuinely enjoy my life and I enjoy having the freedom that that this career has afforded me to just go and and do other stuff. Like I I love being able to play pretend and entertain people, but I also love you know the rest of my life. And I think that's the biggest motivating factor for me to keep doing what I'm doing. That plus the fact that I cannot really imagine myself doing anything else at this point. So, <laughs> of, a, of all the roles you've had like throughout your entire career, which one have you felt like the most connected to? Like the one character that, whether it be a, something in your life that like made the performance better, or just the character's story? Like what? I what mean, I, I I like the way that you phrased this question as opposed to which character is your favorite character, because that's always like trying to pick your favorite child. But uh, I I have felt I've felt a strong connection with a lot of different roles that I've played over my career. I think I've I've got to say that uh, the one that I I, I think I've got to go with Nine S from from Near Automata, and again I'm super thrilled to be able to to be playing with that again right now, uh, working on the anime. But the story is just so good. It's it's not even about the fact that I can relate to the character really well just because like I have similar experiences or something. Because there have been jobs like that where I've worked on something and I'm like, oh, this hits close to home. Because this is really similar to something that I'm going through in my life right now. But with with a story like Nier, it's just so well written and, and there's so much depth to those characters that it's just easy to to slide right into that role because it, because it's all like I feel like all the work is done for me and I can just kind of play, which is really really cool. What are some of your interests outside of acting? I know yeah you think you're <laughs> Twitch, you're a Twitch where you do a yes. lot of board games stuff. So. Uh yeah, so the big the two big things that people know me for 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 what I do outside of acting, obviously I'm a huge board game nerd. Uh, I, I do stream on twitch.tv slash BNB tabletop every Sunday night that I'm not at a convention, uh, the board and barrel. It's a show where me and some of my friends and then guests con consisting of voice actors and content creators and sometimes board game developers. We come and play board games for four hours at a time. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I love board games. I love streaming board games. Uh, I think if if there's one thing that I could imagine myself doing for money, if anyone would pay me for it, it would be playing board games, um, other than other than acting. Uh, I'm also, as a lot of people who know me know, I am a big fan of the Colorado Avalanche. Hell yeah! Uh, big big time hockey fan. I play beer league hockey one night a week. I love hockey. I I have since I was a kid. Partially. What do you play? I tend to play left wing, okay. sometimes right. I, honestly, I've played all positions. I don't like to play center because I'm terrible at winning face-offs, uh, but I'm comfortable pretty much. Play I mean, I'm, I'm equally bad at every <laughs> position. We'll put it that way. I, I love hockey. <laughs> 
You think the Az have another run in this year? I think they have a chance. I think it is not nearly as much of a home run as it was last yeah. year. They got a chance though. They they definitely have a chance. <laughs> I do want to bring bring back the board game question. In in all of like your history of playing board games, right? Which one has been I like can you try to word this right? If you like what's the one thing like people who like create board games or make board games that's like, ah, don't do that anymore, like, oh we wish we could fix this, like in playing board games what's something that you think could i think the mechanic that i i think it's i think it's a dead mechanic now anyway i don't think modern board games utilize it anymore but roll and move is ridiculous it's it's random and and pointless like the old candy land actually candy land i think was with cards yeah which is already better than roll and move roll and move is terrible and i'm glad that modern board games don't use it anymore <laughs> who's your favorite out of all time my favorite avalanche player yeah, out of yeah. all time? Oh, it's got to be... I think I got to go Joe Sackick. For I, all time? For yeah. all time, Joe Sackick. I mean, give it another five or ten years, Kale McCarr or Nathan McKinnon could top him. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. My, <laughs> mine's, mine's Patrick Wall, but uh, yeah. I think that's just because I yeah. loved how cocky he was. I love... He was my first jersey, actually. My you first the player jersey, but I have I have a Sackick, I have a Forsberg, I have McK- I got a lot, I got a lot of jerseys yeah. now. <laughs> so I do have another kind of question, more about the like the in the booth stuff for voice acting sure. or video games. Uh, can you go into detail about how much like creative control you or like other actors would have in the dubbing process or in the gaming side when like voicing a character? Like, do you get to kind of talk with the director and go, "Hey, this might sound pretty good here." I I always approach it like it's a collaborative effort because uh, I think because I think it is I don't I don't ever think of because I I've kind of had my my fingers in a lot of different pieces of this industry now I've I've been the director I've been the script adapter um, and I feel like uh, I feel like I I don't feel like any of those roles is like the boss over the other the, the actors or anything like that. I feel like it's 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 a, it is a collaborative piece that you're working on. The director is going to be the person hopefully anyway who knows the material better than everybody else that that's involved. Uh not always the case actually. With video games there's there's other pe- there's clients on the line who definitely know the material better than the director does. So you kind of defer to whoever the expert in the room is. A lot of times, but you, I, I, I always feel comfortable and always have felt comfortable pitching my ideas for like, hey, what if we tried something like this? Now, that being said, as actor, I, I recognize that I'm not the expert in the room. So as actor, if I pitch an idea that the director says, actually, no, let's try something else, I'm going to defer to them always. If I feel really, really strongly about something, I might ask, can I just give you one that's that's what I'm thinking? And then you can use it or not. Which more often than not, if that if it comes to that, they don't end up using it. Sometimes they do, and it makes me sleep well at night. <laughs> it's it's good that you have that sense of empowerment just to, you know put things out there. The thing that I think a lot of uh, a lot of newer actors or people in this industry kind of get get stuck feeling like they need to impress people or they need to they, they need to not make waves or or I, I and I I feel like it's it's important to recognize that like everybody in the room is on your side. You're not there like there it's not an adversarial relationship because they all want you to succeed. They all want you to get the line the way that they want it, like the way that they need it. So that they can move on to the next thing, because that's it's 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 all. So it is a collaborative process, and and I think uh, I think a lot of people kind of get stuck in their heads and like, oh, I I, I don't want to disappoint them. I want to give them what they want, and it, it you can't you can't come at it from an approach of I got to give them what they want. You've got to come at it from a collaborative approach of let's make this thing as good as it can be, or or what it needs to be for this particular character. If that yeah. makes sense. I know throughout the years, obviously the dubbing process of like Japanese media to English has kind of gotten better, especially if you look at like modern day examples of like Persona 5's English dub, mm-hmm. Yakuza's, or even like modern dubs like 
uh, My Dress Up Darling or even the Persona 5 anime dub where they're not just translating it and then putting it in there. It's now become like, we're actually going to write it. Yeah, we localize. localize. Yeah. How is the, have you seen kind of like that change from like kind of being from early days to now? You know, I, I feel like I feel like by the time I was breaking into to anime and localized video games, it was already headed in that direction. Um, and I, I've worked with some clients who are much more, no, we need to stick to the Japanese intention with everything. And then other clients that, that are kind of give us a little bit more leeway um to to try and localize and i and i feel like the the mindset has definitely gotten to a point now in the in the industry where we are we are attempting to localize we are trying to make sure that yes we honor the original intention but we also make the the story and the dialogue make sense for western audiences if there's something that's very culturally japanese in the dialogue, and this is especially common with comedy, because what's funny in Eastern culture is not at all the same thing as what's funny in Western culture. So if we want to still make the show funny, we localize. We come up with different stuff that is funny that still fits with whatever the story is, and and we and we change things as as needed around that. And I've seen that that mindset has definitely become more and more prevalent within the industry over the past 10 years yeah for sure i do want to also ask specifically because you, you've obviously voiced in like a lot of you know shonen stuff and like you were always at near which is sure all different all right. yeah yeah how was it voicing a character like mikazuki where oh. gundam is all about like the politics and yeah cool yeah let's fight but there's politics and war and all this stuff where they I think they do a good job of handling all that. <laughs> it's it's funny that you ask that question like that because the politics are are not a factor for Mikazuki at all in that show. Like he's he is a warrior focused on the fight and taking care of his loved ones. But uh, honestly like on a on a personal note getting to work on Gundam like that was huge for me. When I when I booked that job, I had yet to book a lead role in in anything that anybody really cared about yet. Uh, I had worked on some other anime that where I'd been a supporting character, something, you know, in the focal, like in the, the realm of the focal point of the show, but not necessarily the leading role. And I got the audition for uh, Mobile Suit Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans, and I went, oh man, it would be so cool to work on this in some capacity. Because when I was a kid, Toonami was an after-school block and Gundam Wing was my favorite anime, for sure. I went to school in cosplay, before that was a term, as Catra Roberta Winner, uh, on a regular school day, for no reason, because me and my friends had all picked characters from the show that were our character. We were, we were definitely the cool kids at the school. Um, <laughs> so Gundam Wing, was like, like that, that held a special place in my heart, and I got an audition for a Gundam show that was sorta kinda Gundam Wing-ish, because Gundam Wing was like its own thing within the Gundam world, and Iron IBO was was also that, and it, it, it evoked a lot of the same feelings for me just looking at the audition material, and I was like, this is this would be really cool to just be somebody in this show. And and then I booked Mikazuki, and so I got not only did I get to be in it, I got to be a Gundam pilot. I got to be the main character in a Gundam series uh so it was it it was a lot of firsts for me and and it held something you know special to me How as well was, like just recording and like meeting the other actors at panels and just that whole process of like being mikazuki I, until the show's end it was it was definitely still in that period where everything is new and exciting everything is great so i loved everything about it and uh and i've i've crossed paths now with Johnny Young Bosch a couple times. Jeremy and Cassandra, I, I think I've I've gotten to know a little better than 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 him, but not necessarily in relation to Gundam. It's just kind of like it's it's weird how our industry like it's so very solitary. As actors, we work like the actor and the director and the engineer and maybe somebody from the client are in the room, and that's about it. Like it's one actor at a time for dubbing, especially for video games, almost exclusively. 
Occasionally for Western animation, when we're doing prelay recording audio, we will have a, a group record, but that's that's less and less common now. And so it's it's kind of a solitary experience. We don't get to meet the people we're working, quote unquote, with very often until we start doing conventions. And, and then like this is where we socialize with yeah. each other is at these cons. But Johnny's great. Jeremy's fantastic. Cassandra's great. Like I, I love, I love all of those people. They're they're super cool people. Uh, I do have uh, one. I mean, this kind of could relate to all the you know famous actors and voice actors you you've mentioned. But is there any franchise that you've seen or that is coming out with stuff, or whatever? That man, I'd love to work for that. Like that'd be the one like dream thing to work on, whether it be video game anime or working with another voice actor. The big, the big bucket list franchise I kind of sort of get to scratch off now was is Star Wars because uh, I got to do Star Wars Visions. Um, I, I I did the script adaptation for two and a half episodes of of the of that little mini series, and then uh and then I got to play some bit parts in in a couple of them as well, and that was really cool. I still don't really consider that crossed off my bucket list because it's not canon to the Star Wars universe. So I would like to be—I would like to be a named character in Star Wars somewhere, somewhere in the Star Wars universe because I've always been a massive Star Wars fan. Um, and, and in recent years, I have gotten super hooked on the Expanse as a sci-fi nerd. Uh, I don't know if they'll ever do more with that franchise, but sign me up if it happens. <laughs> Is, has there ever been a role where you're, you know, you're recording these lines and everything, and then the darkness of the story just kind of seeps in and, you know, gets to your own mental state where you start feeling bad because of the lines that you're recording and how the story is going? Uh, you know, I, I sort of kind of touched on this in an earlier question, but there have been times when life in general is paralleling a little too closely with what's happening in in the story uh and it makes it really easy to get into the shoes of the character but it also just <laughs> takes a toll on your mental state um and uh yeah that was <laughs> i mean you know when life is already kicking you while you're down it's it's kind of just pilot, putting a little bit of extra salt into your wounds when that when that type of thing happens and uh you kind of just rely on whatever <laughs> whatever sort of therapy coping mechanisms you've got to try and deal with just feeling down in general um i haven't i, I don't think i've had any instances where cuz we tend to we tend to try and keep things light in the booth especially when we're working on heavy material like it, the the director Every director I've ever worked with on something like that has known this is heavy stuff. Let's take a breather. Let's joke around a little bit once we get through the really heavy, dense, awful stuff. We can decompress for a little bit and then and then get back to it. It's I, I think that's kind of crucial to to fostering a healthy work environment. The reason that we add uh, we're we're all near fans, but we're also very big into Berserk. Mm. I know that you were Judo. Judo was my personal favorite character. I had obviously. Uh, that was such a short session for me because I because that was that was in the the not the original the Berserk, Titans, but yeah, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. So it I, it was a really quick session. Like I think I I actually think I did two or three sessions for it, but they were all really short, like thirty minutes or something. So I barely even remember that project now. For near, yeah, stuff got heavy, but it was, it was cathartic in a way, and it was just, and it was such a good story that I was like, oh, this is awesome! Like I'm so, this is so cool getting to work on this. Like I, I, I never started feeling down about that project. It was always just sheer joy at getting to to be part of it. Yeah, to to do a good mix of beautiful sadness. And yeah, beautiful. yeah, yeah. I, and I and I kind of love, I like dark stories to a certain extent. I like it when it's a gut punch that makes you go, "Oh, that sucks so bad for that character." That's awesome. That's great <laughs> storytelling. Because <laughs> life 
does that. And I, I like when media gives you, I mean, obviously there are times in life, like during the pandemic, we need a series like Ted Lasso to come yeah. along and make us all feel good and warm inside. But when life is good in general, I like to see a little bit of the, the darker, dirtier stuff. So <laughs> just want to say thank you so much, Kyle, for your time. Hopefully uh, we'll get you back and we'll just play some board games or something. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks for listening to yet another production of the Awesome Cast, your podcast for everything awesome. You can find us online at awesomecast.com, O S M C A S T dot com, or, you know, wherever you find your podcast, just search for Awesome Cast. You can also find us on the social medias, Awesome Cast at Twitter or on Facebook. Of course, you can also find our wonderful interview guru, the greatest living interviewer, John Robbins at J5 is Live. Or perhaps you'd like to follow our amazing editor, Anna, at Angel Darkfire. Or just me, at It's Basil Time on Twitter. Our theme song is produced by DJ Inabito, and you can find him online at djinabito.com. And once again, thanks for listening to the Awesome Cast. We appreciate you.